Hey there, Touch Designer developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're gonna take a look at using the timer chop and a specific mode of the timer chop actually called parallel timers to drive a texture 3D that is attached to these instances that we see on screen. It's going to allow us to independently control per instance uh, such components as the speed with which we're moving through the frames that are stored in that texture 3D, as well as the number of times that we loop through those frames, um, among other things. So it's a really cool and useful technique. And with that, let's jump right in. So let's begin by deleting everything and starting fresh. We're going to start by setting up our texture 3D that we're gonna use for these instances. And if you're interested in learning more about the texture 3D top and what's going on there, check out the video 3D texture tricks in Touch Designer on this channel, the Interactive and Immersive HQ. Elbers goes into detail uh, with that operator and kind of what's going on there and shows you some additional techniques that we're not going to cover in this video, but are uh, important to know and also cool to experiment with. So. Let's begin by adding a movie file in, which is going to be the texture or the number of frames actually that we're going to store in our texture 3D. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do here is point it to the good old count.mov file found in the default folder there. And then I'm going to set the play mode here to locked to timeline. That's important for our frames to um, be added to our texture 3D in order. So let's add, then add the texture 3D top. You'll see that it starts filling up automatically. The first thing that we're going to do is set our cache size to 100 because we have 100 frames in the count MOV uh, video file. And then I'm going to turn pre-fill on. And you'll see that because we set our uh, play mode here to lock to timeline, our frames are appearing in order from the lower left number one all the way up to the upper right at 100. So we're actually all set with the texture 3D top now and we can attach a null to the end of that. And now we need some geometry to actually apply uh, this texture to. So I'm going to start off with a rectangle SOP. And in the size parameter, this is a uh, 16 by nine kind of typical video resolution that we're seeing here. And if we middle mouse click, you can see here that we've got uh, the aspect ratio 16 by nine, and that equates to a 1.77 by one aspect ratio. So what I'm gonna do here within my rectangle SOP is change the X size parameter to 1.77. Then I'll right click on the output and go to the comp page where I will grab a geometry comp. Cool. So to apply or to start applying this uh, texture 3D to our geo, we need to do that via a material. So I'm gonna add a constant mat first and then I'll drag that onto the geo and then hit parameter material. After that, we can just simply drag the null one operator or top onto the constant, which will add it to the color map parameter. And you can see already that we have what looks like a combination of two of the frames of our, uh, our movie file in appearing on our geo, and that's great. Now let's add a grid sop to generate instances. Within the grid SOP, let's set our size X to 3.65 and then our size Y to 1.05. In the rows, uh, set that to two and the columns parameter set to three. Then let's add a null to the end and we will then rename that to null space POS for positions one thing I like to do here just to see which number, uh, which point number is associated with which particular point is to hit the viewer active button in the bottom right, head to display options, and then hit the point numbers option there. And that'll just help us see which uh, instance is the first instance and which is the last instance, which will be helpful when we're assigning values with our timer chop in just a moment. 
So now that we've done that, let's start generating instances by heading back to the geo, heading to the instance page, turning instancing on, and then we'll drag null POS into our translate operator. Then I'll grab the P0, P1, and P2 channels for the translate XYZ parameters. So cool, we're generating some instances and that's awesome. Uh, let's render this, why don't we? Um, first thing that we'll need, of course, for a render, which is uh, giving us a little warning right now, is a camera. So once you add a render top, also make sure to add a camera top as well, or a camera comp, rather, as well. And then I move this backwards a little bit. Uh, I think I went with a value of seven for the Z translate parameter, which gave us a nice view of all of our instances on screen. Finally, you can composite a background in by adding a constant and setting the color here to black or whatever color you want really. And then on the output page, turning on comp with input and setting the operation to under. I'll add a uh, final null there to the end just for good measure. So my original version of this also applied color to each one of the instances so that we can kind of tell them apart a little bit more. So to do that, I'm going to use a noise top. And here, I'm going to head to the comment page and set my resolution first. And I'm going to do that by referencing the number of rows and columns within our grid. So for our X parameter, we're gonna reference the number of columns. So we're gonna type in op, open and close parentheses, single quotes, grid one, and then dot par dot calls. Then for our Y parameter, we will copy and paste that. And then instead of referencing the calls parameter, we'll instead reference the number of rows. And what that should do is give us a three by two resolution, which is really small, but will give us the ability to assign color to each one of these instances. Then I'll set my input and viewer smoothness nearest pixel so we can really see what each one of those will look like. And then head back to the noise page, flip monochrome off, and let's bring our exponent down to maybe like 0.3. And you can play around with the amplitude and offset if you want. I'm also going to modify the seed until I find something that produces different colors per instance, which these look like they're pretty close. I basically just don't want two of the same color next to each other. So um, I think this one actually is fine. Let's go with that. And then we'll attach a null and call this null space color. Come back within our geo, head to the instance two page, come down to whoa, color operator, drag that in and then grab RGB. And we don't really need the alpha channel. Um, and then let's also set the color mode here to add so that those are brighter and easier to see. Cool, so that's what we've got so far, different colors assigned to different instances. But now if we want to actually control the specific frame that we're grabbing from our texture 3D, we're going to do that, as I mentioned, with the timer chop. So let's grab that first of all. So if you're familiar with the timer chop, you're probably used to the ability to, you know, start the timer, set a specific length, a delay, and probably use it in this sort of a fashion where you just got one single timer going and maybe run functionality based on that. What's interesting is that if we head to the segments page, you may have used a DAT to define specific segments for this timer, which it'll kind of sequentially go through. But one of the other interesting modes is the ability to use parallel timers, which as we'll see in a moment, allows us to run a number of timers all at once and specify different settings for each one of those timers. So it's as if we had, again, like many timers all within one timer chop. So let's grab a table dat so that we can start defining those different parameters. So before we add anything to the table dat, I'm just gonna come back to the timer chop and drag the table dat onto the segments dat parameter. And then I'm gonna set the segment method here to parallel timers. 
Cool. So let's start adding content to the table. So we need a number of columns. And in this case, we're going to start off with one called begin. Now begin is kind of like the delay parameter. If you're used to creating segments with a table that you might have used the delay parameter as its own column in the table. But what's cool about begin is that you can set a specific point after which the timer has started to trigger that uh, timer to begin, or rather, you can set a moment in time after you hit start that the timer will then start at. So that means that they don't have to be in order of uh, what is triggered next, uh, which is really useful when you're defining segments. So uh, let's start with that begin column, and then we'll follow that with length, which is just like you would think the length of that independent timer. Then we'll add one called cycle, which will allow us to turn cycling on and off and allow us to loop our uh, texture. Cycle limit is another on off parameter that allows us to uh, set limits for the uh, number of times that we cycle. And if these are looking familiar, that's because they are familiar. If you uh, didn't have the segment stat defined there, we'd have the ability to turn cycling and cycle limiting on and off. And as you might expect, we also have the ability to set a max number of cycles. So that is our final column that we're going to add here today, max cycles. Now we have a total of six instances. And so we're going to create six different timers. So what I'm going to do is add um, six column or six rows rather below our first one. Cool, so now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, all ready to go. So I am going to set these kind of arbitrarily for now. Um, we'll just start off by setting them all to the same uh, sort of settings right now. I'm gonna set the length to be two for all of our different timers. I'll set the begin parameter at zero initially. And then for cycle, uh, we can we can turn that on, I guess, for each one so that it'll loop indefinitely because we're gonna turn cycle limiting off. It's important to note that the cycle and cycle limit parameters are just simply on and off. Um, for max cycles, again, we'll just start with zero to kind of get an idea of how this functions. So now that we've done that, you might've noticed that a bunch of different channels have now been added to the timer chop. And if we were to hit initialize and then start, you can see that we now have a bunch of timers all synchronized together and continuously looping because they all have the cycle parameter turned on. So one thing I'm gonna do here uh, before we jump back to our table is turn off the ready and done channel in our outputs just so we can see these timers uh, channels, timer fraction channels rather independently. Then if I start to turn off cycling for some of these channels, what we should see is that some of them will finish while the others cycle. So again, we have like full control over each one of these channels and that is really fancy and cool because uh, you know, if not for this functionality, we would need multiple timers in order to achieve this kind of function. So, now that we've got these kind of running, I think what I'll do is add limitations to the cycles and kind of change some of these values. You're gonna to have to kind of play around with this to get values or uh, to get specific looks that you like the best, but um, I'm just gonna arbitrarily change some of these values in my length column. I'll set um, for the, the different timers that have cycling, I'll turn on the cycle limit function and again add some uh, different number of max cycles and then I might as well add a different begin time for a couple of these as well. Now that we've done that, if we initialize and start the timer, we should see that none of our uh, timer channels look the same except for 
Well, our third and fifth channel are similar because they have the same length, but uh, we can quickly remedy that by modifying the length and maybe the start or begin time as well. Cool, so now they're all noticeably different from one another, and that's gonna be great for our application today. So now that we've got them all kind of set up, ready to roll, uh, what we can do is use the shuffle chop to take these different channels and turn them or swap our channels rather and samples which will give us all of those points in order on a single channel and another thing I'm going to do here is turn on use first sample only and then I'll kind of move that to the right. So this is how we need to work when we're using instances because we have an instance for each sample within our chop channel, not each channel within our chop. Uh, so that's gonna make that functional with our instancing setup. And then I'm also gonna rename this to something else. Instead of timer fraction, I'm gonna call this texture W because that's what we're going to apply it to in our geo. And then finally, I'm also going to add a, um, a math chop. In the math chop, let's set the two range to fall between 0.005 and 1.005. Now that doesn't mean a whole lot right now, but what it will do later on is ensure that when we are uh, at the end point or the beginning of our timer, we won't see these kind of mixed frames. We'll see just the uh, frame number one instead. Um, cool, so with that, let's attach our null to the end and we'll call this null space texture W. And then let's head up to the geo comp and we're going to drag this into our texture coordinate operator parameter. And then we're going to grab our texture W channel on the texture W parameter. And with that, we can display this in the background, initialize our timer. And if we hit start, we should see that all of our instances will animate through that count.mov file at a slightly different rate or time. So now that we've got this all set up, one important thing to note that we haven't talked about yet is that each one of these rows uh, corresponds to a specific instance. And as we kind of briefly touched on at the beginning, our first instance is actually this one here in the lower left. And we can figure that out via our null POS operator that we set up earlier uh, by displaying those point numbers. So that means that if we wanted to say, change the settings for this particular instance, we just come to row number one in our table. And then we could do something like set the begin time to say one and maybe the length to something dramatically longer than everything else, say like 10. And then if we were to initialize and start our timer, what we should see is that our instance number zero, I guess if we're using the correct terminology, is animating very slowly compared to the others. So that's how you can start to use this to specifically kind of tailor the animation that is being applied to a specific instance. Um, so with that, we will start to close out this video. Uh, hopefully that was a brief but educational look at how you can start to utilize the parallel timers mode of the timer chop. Uh, you don't have to use it for, you know, just texture 3D based purposes. It can really be used for any kind of animation um, that you can think of in Touch Designer. And it's a super useful way to be able to specifically control, you know, at a very granular level the, uh, the type of animation or the speed or the, the timing of that animation um, in, a, in a simple way. So um, hope you found that useful. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. 
It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.